kid. Seriously. So, Mark, we just finished episode seven of True Detective season three, entitled The Final Country. So we're going to do our full spoiler review. We're not going to bother with anything that isn't spoiler. So if you haven't listened, as always, or you haven't watched it, as always, just turn this off and uh, come back when you have and then watch it three, four times to make us feel better about ourselves. I thought this episode could be described as a loose ends episode because several plot threads are tied up pretty well. Tom commits suicide, and I am doing air quotes while I say that, in the tower where the children were abducted and leaves a typed suicide note. We also get to find out what happened to Harris James. We realize he is the one that, we realize that West and Hayes killed Harris James, which was not a big surprise. We also find out that the one-eyed man is tied to the Hoyt Corporation and is most likely involved in everything, probably also was involved with Lucy, who may have also sold her children to the Hoyt Corporation, and we get a couple of surprise cameos in this one that I was not expecting. So a lot of stuff happened. Mark, what were your initial thoughts on finishing this one? Um, My first impression, the one that lasts me most with, is that I figured they should have titled this Grumpy Old Detectives. Because I, I, I found some unexpected humor in watching these two very old men um, trying to, especially when it came to the mysterious car outside Hayes' house, see these two old men kind of daughter around in order to hatch their master plan to get the guy's driver's license, or excuse me, license plate. I, I found that unintentionally hilarious. You know, um, I, I, I will say on a serious note, there was a point where, Hey, or uh, yeah, Hayes is talking to West, and he kind of you can't tell if he's dementia at the moment or not, but basically is telling him I'm really sorry about what happened with Harris James, and I thought that was actually a really good, strong moment in the episode, one of the best single individual moments between the characters, and it kind of made me think how interesting this series would be if it only happened in 2015, and you mm-hmm. you only kind of found out as. Hayes found out. So that, that was something that just uh, occurred to me. Is I think that could have been a really interesting take. But anyways, I digress. Jump jump back in. Well, yeah, and I, I like that idea, too, because uh, especially for me, I'm not overly invested in them as old men. No, I haven't been at all up until this episode. Right. It, it, it's really been kind of a framing device um, with the the news reporter who – and. Uh, we'll come back to her in a minute because I realized something from last week that actually kind of bothered me this week, but they're a framing device. And so to then have them take the foreground and to be, Oh, okay. These are essentially the leads we're following now. And the flashbacks are really just filling in the holes to get us up to speed with where they are now. um, I found a little annoying. Um, And it's the exact same problem I had with the first season too, in that, They spend so much time with old Rust Cole just as a framing device and then to suddenly a couple episodes towards the end switch it out and be, oh, okay, now he is the main action character. I I felt that totally that was a a problem for me, that shift. And so I felt that again with this episode because, again, this season has wound up being very much hitting the beats of the first season in that respect. Well, and we get a very specific reason why it might be following the same beats, because yeah. our, our first big cameo was, was Colin Hart in a newspaper clipping where they might be linked, the, their case might be linked to this case. It might be a similar thing. Obviously, dolls and, you know, wood creations played a heavy part in the first season, uh, and the dolls might be from a similar type organization. And we actually saw them, a picture of them in a newspaper that the, the journalist showed. So... What did you think about seeing that cameo? Because I had some specific thoughts, but what did you think when you saw that? Well, I had read, I'd been doing some reading on the season before, and I so I knew that it was supposed to take place in the same universe. And so there was this, you know, there was this kind of broad connection that all of, all of these true detectives take place in the same world. You know, and I saw that, so I wasn't really overly surprised when I saw it. I, I have some ideas on it as a theory. I think it's kind of a red herring 
but I want to hear you. You sound like you've got some strong opinions, so I want to hear those first. So I did not see that coming, and I did not read that they were in the same universe or, or spent much time thinking about them being in the same universe. So when I first saw it, I was very excited. And in my head, I kind of got a rush of adrenaline, and then I, I thought about how, well, that explains a lot of how the similar beats, right? Because one of the kind of complaints going into this when I watched the trailers was like, it looks like they're they're overcompensating for how poorly received season two was by basically recreating season one. But if they're really kind of a continuation of a, another story or a spinoff of, a, of that same story, then it makes a little bit more sense. Then after I kind of settled down from just the excitement of seeing them, I kind of felt like that was just kind of a cheer, cheap trick to to resonate with the viewers, and it worked on me in those mm-hmm. minutes, but it it didn't it didn't last. So it was it was yeah it was like it was like doing a a whip it from a whipped cream can for for fifteen twenty seconds, man. I was pretty high, and then I came down. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um. But I see. So I think that this episode has has me pretty firmly committed to a theory of the crime now. And my theory runs counter to what I think their introduction is. And so I, I feel like putting them in there is, is a red herring. It's meant to make us think that this is a bigger crime than it actually is. Just like in season one, where we thought, oh, okay, there's this big crime involving these rich pedophiles and this whole network. And it really just turned out to be two creepy, you know, backwoods guys. And anything more than them was just in the shadows and implied and, and was never solved on. And I've got a feeling that this is the same thing is happening here with season three. And that to include them is just to make us think that this is going to be something bigger than it's going to wind up being. So do you, do you have more details on that theory? Why don't you just jump into it? I do. And so you remember they're talking about the Hoyts. I think it's daughter, Isabel. Yep loses her family okay and what happens to mothers sometimes who lose young children and the reason i thought of this is because we actually had a similar occurrence in our neighborhood where we grew up and i don't know i don't even know if you know this i i found out about this from our mother that um one street over there was a woman who had a daughter who died pretty young and She never changed the bedroom and never, you know, took anything out. And occasionally she would invite young girls from the neighborhood over to play in that bedroom. Wow. No, I did not know that. So you're thinking that you, okay. So you're thinking that she might've been who they were meeting in the woods was Isabel, the daughter, and that she was just playing with them in a not so horrible way. And that she might've been brought to the pink room just to play. And that that was a happy memory. Is that where you're... I think what happened is that, yes, she was probably meeting them out in the woods. Maybe she was meeting them out in the woods. Maybe Hoyt was me or not, not Hoyt, excuse me. June. Watts. June, Mr. June or Watts um, was meeting them out in the woods and grooming them. The idea was that they were going to kidnap the daughter and the daughter was going to live in the pink room in the dungeon basement as her substitute for her lost daughter in the process of, you know, the abduction, finalizing, whatever, the brother wound up getting killed. And so that's how it went. I'm still not hundred percent sure on how the mom is involved in this. Um, Cause they, they hint heavily that, that Lucy and Watts are involved and were probably yeah. the two people under the sheets and that she may have, that suggested that she may have actually sold Lucy or uh, sold Julie to yeah. the Hoyts. But see, I think Isabel is the one under the sheets with Watts. Yeah, that could be following them around. The two, they're the two going around looking for substitute for her daughter. And that Halloween is when they see the two kids realize, Hey, these are the ones, this is the daughter that we can get to her place. And then voila, we have the chain of events that leads to her being abducted the, the brother being killed and then her living in the pink room. Sure. Saw. And of course the family knows about this and Harris James knows about it. So he is the one who's, you know, covering the tracks for it. And that's his involvement. But so to bring this all around, I think the inclusion of Rustin Cole is 
in all the talk of pedophile rings is to make us think it's a bigger crime that it's this international pedophile ring with you know rich men and politicians and businessmen and blah blah, blah. when the reality is just like in season one it was just two hillbillies this is just a grieving mother and her servant who did something bad which is the the theory that our our friend at slithers with like nine s's Ooh. put forth as well too, because yeah. they do mention early in the season about losing the daughter, and then they, they bring it back around. It seems to make sense, but there needs to be more to it, I think, than just that to fill an entire episode, and we still don't have uh, what happens between Amelia and what happens between um, Hayes it, to to end their relationship. We don't know if she's still alive, though if you watch the trailer for the next episode, I don't know, did you watch that? Uh, no, I did not. So you, they kind of enter, they kind of put a fourth timeline in very briefly at the beginning of this episode where it's where Hayes is taking his daughter to college. Mm-hmm. And it looked like in the trailer for the next episode, they showed a little bit more of that timeline and it looked like Hayes's why Amelia was there. Uh, I could be wrong though. Cause it was a brief flash for a second. So that leads me to believe that she might still be alive in, I don't know, 2010 or whenever that would have been that the, the daughter goes off to college. Because w- one of the things I've been toying with is if really just killing Harris is all that West and Hayes did in 1990, that seemed disappointing because that was the very obvious thing yeah. that they would have done, which led me to kind of theorize that maybe they did something to Amelia. And that's why she hasn't been around or whatever, isn't it? You know, maybe they even killed her. I, who knows? Uh, so I still feel like there's got to be some kind of twist coming because I'll feel a little bit unsatisfied if all they did, all all they did. I mean, I realize they murdered a man and that West really didn't want to have anything to do with that and all, all that. But just from a, a viewing mystery standpoint, that was a really obvious one. So it, yeah. it, it feels like there should be something more to that. Yeah, no, I agree. So, I mean, obviously we need to know basically what happened to Amelia. We need to know why he's estranged from his daughter. Um. We need to have some kind of resolution to the mystery, um, whether it's we actually find out what's happening or not. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel like that's, I mean, considering the pace that this show takes, that might be enough for them to somehow <laughs> squeeze into an hour in between, you know, long overhead tracking shots and you know, ponderous staring at himself in different stages of his life well what i'm actually most excited for was the 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 second surprise cameo that i didn't know it was coming at the very tail end of the episode and that means i think we're going to get probably very early on next week a very eloquent monologue from one michael rooker as yes. mr mr hoyt i was excited they cast him i didn't realize that he was going to be in this so it, he was just a voice on a phone i didn't look on imdb but i am 99.9 percent sure that was michael rooker so I think I, I would bet my left nut that that was him. There's okay. no that voice does not belong to another person on this planet. Ex- exactly, that it's a distinct voice. So I I am excited to see what what he brings. Before we move into our couple comments, do you have any uh, final thoughts you want to put about this yeah, episode yeah, or the yeah. upcoming? The other thing that I, I wanted to circle back to is that um, it, you know, we found out last week that the the news reporter was sleeping with Hayes' son. And on the surface, it was like, oh, okay. I, I'm not entirely sure why they did it, but okay, you know, whatever. It's kind of a subplot. It, it was maybe it was a mystery. It was meant to be another red herring, you know, a false clue. that just turns out, oh, it just turns out to be a son. But then that means in all likelihood that this lady was probably sleeping with the son in order to get the story because if you think about it, why is this, you know, why is this reporter from New York or L.A. sleeping with this cop from Podunk, Arkansas, right? Because because he's he's a gorgeous man who's got insane shoulder muscles. Right. And there aren't, you know, <laughs> millions of insanely good looking men in the thousand miles in between where they are and where she lives. Sure. Right. So obviously, if you think about it, that means, OK, she's sleeping with him in order to get closer to the story. And for a show that has a history of misogyny and not tweeting women white, it just, to me, to, to kind of come to that realization was just another sort of, oh, really? This is this one more thing that we, one more way to kind of denigrate a woman in this story that really wasn't that necessary or move the plot forward? So 
in retrospect for me it's another little a little downer and a little disappointment so i don't i don't think it was a red herring i think i mentioned this last week too i i think it was thrown in there to demonstrate that when Hayes's mind is working properly he is mm-hmm. still just a super sharp detective who's able to pick up on things and able to read people he's still that hunter right that's the metaphor yeah. they've used for him I think that's why they included it I don't think there's going to be any more mention of it or it's going to lead to anything else in the last episode you you have extrapolated a whole backstory that could very well be correct but that's something you also just put into it yourself Um, But what I think it really points to more is how poorly I think Amelia has been developed as a character. Because there is just, there is nothing I like about Amelia. I don't find very redeeming qualities in her. Her little set piece this week is her basically neglecting the kids, risking the kids' lives at the bar in order to go meet with the guy because she's so obsessed with the case. And I think if you have a more fleshed out and identifiable Amelia then you you don't care as much that Lucy is completely unsympathetic. You don't care as much that this reporter is kind of a bad reporter and just kind of a an asshole about everything. You know, she's trying to get information out of a guy with Alzheimer's to start with, and she's really mean to him when she does it. So I I think it really just more points for me to the the Amelia problem. And I don't I don't th- and I think it, I think these kind of other characters is just something Pizzolatto doesn't think about. He just writes them because he's like, I need this to make this part of the story work. And he doesn't look at the big picture of, hey, all your female characters suck um, in this season. They all sucked in episode or in season one. And then in season two, you you tried so hard to make them be good, likable characters that they almost became a little cartoony. But to each their own, we will move into comments before we wrap it up. We got another comment from our friend uh, Slithers, and he talked about how he thought that that uh, West and Tom might have been having a relationship because, you know, Tom is never married. They make a big point of that in episode six, never had kids, any of that. And obviously Tom and West had a very strong bond. There's still a possibility of that, but I don't see that coming personally now after watching season seven because I kind of feel like we're wrapped up with Tom and I'm not sure and making that relationship I'm not sure if it adds to it at all or not um, yeah. unless there's some some more layer to it and then we had another comment from uh, duels d-o-o-l-z two which was that I'm just having a problem with how slow everything is moving I wished they could just kind of do this in fast forward I feel like with the content they've given us, this could have been about four or five episodes. I won't necessarily disagree with that, especially if your main pull is the mystery. I am someone who enjoys the atmosphere they've created. Um, that was something that was a big hook for me in, in season one. But there are definitely been some slow points that have been hard to to get through. But I'm guessing uh, the last episode, you, you've done all the hard work now. The last episode is probably going to be jam-packed. Yeah, I think so too. Though um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect the last episode to be action packed. Um, I hope not. Because aside from throwing their cane at whoever the suspect could be, these two old men are not going to be running through a, a corn maze like they were in season one, where you've got the big showdown um, with against the hillbilly. So it's it's going to be, I think, um, I think it's going to be actually pretty slow paced. Yeah. Now, it'll, completely honest. it'll be interesting. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be big and action, but it's, it's going to have a lot of information in it. And I think the information will, whether it's satisfying or not, it'll build towards that reward that we've been spending seven other episodes doing. So that is going to wrap it up for us on this, uh, second to last episode of season three. You can leave us a comment, uh, on the YouTube channel here or at Twitter at Kids Seriously, at Luke underscore Neitzel, and at Mark Neitzel 23. And we will see you next week.